morning, everybody, and welcome back to Hope and Anchor Community Church. We're super excited to have you guys again. It's going to be an amazing service, and I don't know about you, but I'm excited because it's starting to get warmer outside. It's yeah. nice. Better than that cold. Yeah. It's really, really nice, yeah. Amazing. So let's kick off this morning and open our hearts to worship. Jesus. 
to the hide of God Your heart, oh God Is so The sweetest presence know Emmanuel in throne My life cornerstone Jesus Redeeming Prince of Peace The hope that sets me free Eternal King of Kings, Jesus. My delivering peace, the one who rescues me, the rest where. Savior, friend, Messiah, all I need. The greatest story told, Jehovah. Them precious gold, Jesus. The world shaped into men, glory and restraint. Forever, Lord, you reign, Jesus. Come on, let's sing. upon our souls your name forever in control compassionate Messiah mild and humble King compelled to work his God
Thank you so much, guys, for that wonderful time of worship. Mm -hmm. Now let's see what God has been doing this week with our first testimony. Hi, my name is Daniel, and I've been a part of Hope and Anchor Church for about two years now. And uh, the first thing I really wanted to thank you guys for is the worship team. Uh, I really want to appreciate the worship team and, and what they've been doing each week, uh, even filming some of their own songs for the service. Uh, and I really feel like they set the mood right for when Pastor Chris comes in and teaches. And then I also wanted to point out the uh, the evangelisms. I really wanted to thank you for the impact you're having on the Camden Town community. Uh, and I really appreciate the, the different food tables that you set up uh, on Friday and Saturday. So thank you. It's a massive blessing. Yes, thank you so much for that amazing testimony, Daniel. It's so amazing to see how God's moving throughout the week and doing things in everybody's lives. Uh, before we continue and before we start the word, let's move on to the second testimony of the week. Hi, Hope and Anchor. So recently we have been doing some local evangelism. Um, and what me and my housemates did was that we reached out to the community, asked if anyone wanted a craft box for their children so they could work and maybe work on the crafts and um, really get that family back in to the house and um, maybe a little break from uh, from all the stress. Um, only one person um, responded but we made a craft box, sent it away to them and a week later we received an email um, and it was um, the father who was in need. Uh, he really wanted to bless his partner. Um, they had been together for 12 years, it was a birthday, they had been let down by a delivery of groceries. Um, so he was like, is there any way you guys can can help? Um, and we did, and it's so amazing to see how we, as a church, can show God's abundantness in that way. Um, so yeah, it was really amazing to that they reached out again and said, hey, we're in need. Um, so yeah, it's such a beautiful thing. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that amazing time with you. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Father, thank you because it doesn't matter what time zone. Father, it doesn't matter what moment in the day, what situation we have been. Father, your presence, Father, is more than enough, Lord. It doesn't matter what we have been into, Father. Father, it doesn't matter what we have experienced or we haven't, Lord. You are a present Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. It's with great joy. That today, I, Chris, in the name of Jesus, I greet you to Hope and Anchor. There's another service. We have experienced such a great time of testimonies and worship. And uh, the Lord has been speaking to us in the last two weeks in such a rich way. I don't think I have gotten straight up into the juice of this. And today, I really feel that the Holy Spirit wants to close it. So I'm a little bit under pressure. But if you know me, and you know me, I, I work better under pressure. Today coming out of Luke 4 again, we're going to go out of the NIV version. And today, today we, we feel that the Holy Spirit is calling a power to display. We have been in this series, in this series like Show Your ID. We talked about I Belong last week. And today we're actually on the verge, on the finishing touches of the Holy Spirit. Say, hey, you got the power to display. Today, this segment is called by the Holy Spirit. I know God gave me that name. It's the power to display. We have a faith that is, that is charged with the power to display. We're going to go back to Luke 4. We have, been able, we have not been able to escape for this, from there, from that place that Jesus was habitating and actually has actually catapulted into our today because His Word, He's the Word, is alive today. We're going to go from Luke 4, verse 16 this time in the NIV version. It reads like this. He... He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue. As was his custom, he stood up to read. He was his custom. Jesus, usually, usually he's doing the same thing. He's healing, he's delivering, he's doing a great thing in our lives. Usually, that will be his custom. And he was doing his thing. Are you doing your thing? Has this week felt like you're doing your thing? Or are you succumb into the things of others, other mindsets, other understandings? Or you have been walking on the way that God gave you to walk. Jesus was doing his thing. And verse 17 says, And the scroll of the prophet I was handed to him. He didn't have to ask for it. It was handed to him. How many things you've been handing over to Jesus this week? 
and he says, unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. You didn't have to tell him where to read. You didn't have to tell him what to do this week. He unrolled what you gave him and he told you what he was about. And it's beautiful. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. Verse 18 says, the spirit of the Lord, our Lord is on me. He's not only in me, but on me. Back in the day, Jesus says on me because he was still not in us like he is today, but he's on us and in us right now. This is the good news. This is already starting really good. God, the spirit of the Lord is on me and in me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom, freedom for the prisoners, freedom for the prisoners and to recover, to recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free. Verse 19 says to proclaim the year, the year of the Lord's favor. I know it doesn't feel like that, but God calls the things that are not just seem like that, just to be how he sees them, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a favor year. 20 says, then he rolled up the scroll. He just closed it and gave it back. He gave it back to the attendant, the one that was assisting what you are living, the one that he has been talking to about your life, for everyone that is used to be pastored by someone, for anyone that has a good friend that says, hey, I don't know if you're right in this point. This is your attendant. This is the one that you, you see in Jesus give the scroll back. And it says, it says that he sat down. He gave it back to your pastor. He gave it back to the person that ushers you into the presence of God, the worship team, the people that give you testimonies. He said that I sat down. I sat down because I am finished. In that culture, that's what it meant. I am finished. I sit down. The Lord sat down. He created the heavens and the earth and he sat down. He sat down. And as we continue, he says that the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fasting on him. He began by saying to them, he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well, all spoke well. There's, there was none left. All spoke well of him. And we're amazed of the gracious words that came from his lips. The words of the prophet Isaiah, but the revelation and the knowledge and the, and the power, the authority that came from his mouth were a very strong, a very strong weapon against the situation that was getting unleashed. Are you with me? Today, the Lord is saying, hey, if you read my word and you have the revelation that I have, that my spirit brings to you, that's a powerful mix. You're able to live in truth, in peace. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing and all spoke well of him. We're amazed of the gracious words, the words of grace. Words with grace. The word, the, the word has been full of grace. The grace of God came through the word. The gracious words that came from his lips. They understood it naturally. They understood it physically. But the Lord is, has been revealing the last two weeks that it's a lot more than this. Are you with me? Let's go deeper. Isn't this Joseph's son? We have been surrounding this question. And I think it has been the pivot of the Holy Spirit for the last two weeks. Who are you? Show your ID. Do you belong? Are you able to do what Jesus says you can do? Are you able to live the way God is wanting you to live? Are you able? Show your ID. Who gave you the credentials? Who gave you the entrance to the glory? Who gave you the entrance to the power, to the momentum of God in this season? Who gave it to you? Show your ID. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. They asked. Jesus was certain they had questions. Jesus was certain we have questions. Jesus was certain you have questions. I have questions. But Jesus is never surprised by why we live in. Verse 23 says, Jesus said to them, Surely you will tell me this quote, this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me. Do hear what in your hometown what you have done in Capernaum. And we discussed that the last week, so I'm not going to go into that. I get a bit nitty about that one because I love when Jesus picks a fight. I love when our gospel is not an, an, an entertainment. It's not something that you put around the rims. 
It's not an adoration. It's not something you put on the tree for Christmas. Our faith is alive and kicking. It's something that is seeking to be the center of the room so it can give everyone in the room direction, understanding, faith, wealth. God, every time he speaks, every word from God, every word from Jesus in this text is bringing to you and to me wealth, a higher understanding of where he's wanting us to be looking at, how he wants us to be looking at it, and who are we to look at it. Jesus is so good. I feel the Holy Spirit so strongly. Come with me into the, there the feet, just right there, right there. God is with me. Surely, surely, I want to understand this word. There you go. You can do an amen. It's be shorter. I received this. Amen, pastor. You can do that. Chris, pastor Chris, how they call me. It's good. It's good. And we take it. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown. Truly, truly, I tell you, he replies. He continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. You're asking me to do here, but you won't accept me because you look at me in the natural. 25 says, I assure you, I, without a doubt, a doubt I am going to assure you that there were many widows in Israel. There were many widows in Israel. I'm just going to give you a lesson. I'm going to use some vehicles, some examples to really explain that in front of you, this word, this person, who I am, your word for today is fulfilled. That you don't have to have doubts in 2021, but because Jesus, that is outside of time, that is God, God himself, is saying, I am fulfilled on your today. I am fulfilled not in only in your history. I'm not fulfilled only in your destiny and the promises that I have given you, if you know me, but I am fulfilled for you, even if you know me or you don't know me in your today. Jesus is coming out, out of the bat, coming full of power, full of strength, coming to teach and to give, to bestow oil. He's coming out of the bat saying, hey, you know what? I am outside of time and I want to give you an inheritance, a worth, an ID, an identity that is outside of time. Are you with me? Let's go. Let's go deeper. I assure you there were many widows. The widows that he's talking about. We talked about it last week. They were in Israel in a time of famine, in Elijah's time as a prophet. And they were all widows, all widows that were not from that place. There was no Israelites. So God is saying, you belong. Last week we saw how God is saying, you belong. I don't care if you think you don't belong. I don't care if someone else or your situations or your structure or your construct says you don't belong. I want to teach you what is your structure, what is your construct. You belong. And we made everyone around us. We have said this to ourselves. And if you didn't, you missed the opportunity. You're coming into a season, coming into a new day. God is saying you, you dress for the occasion. You belong. You're not late to say it today. I belong. I can show my ID. I belong. The weeks have been amazing. You can go back in the videos. I don't want to take much, much time around the world. The Lord is doing something new. He's challenging us. And he says, around, around that moment of Elias' time, there were many widows, but the sky was shut for, for three and a half years. And there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to one, to A, to one and to A. You could be that one. You are that one. You are the widow, maybe a Sarebath. You are the one that God is looking at. You are the one that is in the region that God is looking. God is the God of the world. I don't know if you're in the UK, in the US, and in Africa. We have seen that you're watching from many different places of the world. But this word, the God that says it, the one that ordains it, the one that is speaking it over your life says it's for you. You don't have to live in doubt when you have a God that shows in your today. That's why he doesn't want to be only a God of your religion, of your yesterday. He doesn't want to be a God of what you hope, of your tomorrow. He wants to be the one that convicts you, that transforms you, that models you on your today. Are you with me? This widow, this widow experienced the goodness of God and she 
was the one that God chose. You are the one that God chose. Verse 26 says, Shelaya was not sent to any of them but to one, to a widow in Serapath. Serapath actually in the region of Sidon. 27 says, and there were many, 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 many. Say to someone, many. Because maybe you feel alone, but there's many and the same things that you're living. There's many that are feeling the same feelings, the same stress, the same darkness, the same anxiety, the same famine that you're feeling today. You are not alone in what you're feeling. The Lord says, many in Israel with leprosy. There were many in the time of Elisha. Not only Elijah, but Elisha. Jesus is trying to say, I am a God of generations. I'm not the God that explained this to the first prophet. I am the one that explained to the first and to the second prophet. The one that was spiritually sucking out of that spiritual ooze, that, that spiritual milk from the prophet. I am a God of generations. Who is pastoring you? God is giving through Jesus here so much more today. I see this happening. It says, Elijah, Elisha. The widows with Elijah, the lepers with Elisha. There was many of them, but yet not one of them was cleansed, but Naaman, the Syrian. This lady that was actually cleansed in Serapath, in Sidon, in the region of Sidon, she was not someone from Israel. And this, this, this man Naaman, when we look it up, he's clearly someone from Syria. Someone that was not from the people of Israel around the world. God is challenging us people. God is challenging us to our faith. God is challenging us to understand that the way that we see him has to come into a different spectrum. He has to come into a different way. Are we seeing God through the lens of who he is? Are we seeing our gods, the ones that we are imposed by so many things around us in the light of who he is? Because that's the only way we can lose our idolatry. The way that we perceive things and we give them a place of prominence that actually has to do with our relationship with God. Are you with me? God himself is wanting us to see our routines, our dogmas. You know, our dogma and our values in a different light. He wants us to be free. He wants us to see how we understand things and how they pertain to his presence, his person. And if they don't, they have to change. God is so good like that. Our concept of our lives is getting challenged. Our concept of our lives is getting challenged and the way that we interact is getting challenged. This is not a secret. By the way, around the world, the way that we interact is getting challenged. The way you touch, you hug, you talk, everything around you, the way that you invest, the way that you think, the way that you eat, what you eat and how you eat it, is getting challenged. But the Lord himself is saying, I want to challenge. Not only that, the way that you interact, but even your systems of belief. What you believe. What have you believed of our God? What have you believed of yourself? What have you believed of your brothers and sisters in Christ? How you have believed that He has authority over your government? How He has ushered a new season of a reality? What is that you believe? Your systems of belief are very strong and very important to our God. The Lord is delivering something precious, good, good beef. If this is like a tomahawk, you know, seared both sides and put it into oven with a lot of garlic and a lot of, or the option, a veggie, a veggie patty or something like that, whatever you are into. The Lord maybe is actually searing it both sides and saying, hey, I'm going to sear the flavor and I'm going to tell you how tender I can get it inside of you. He's challenging the way that we perceive the way that we understand. He wants us to understand His presence and put it in a counterbalance between what we understand His presence in and if we're owned by His presence versus if we're owned by our past. In this season, God is challenging. Jesus is challenging the people in the text. Whatever we are surrounded with is getting challenged by God. Are you, cha are, are you, are you owned by, your, by the presence of God or are you owned? Are you owned by your past, owned by the presence, owned by the past? That's our answer to give. The Lord is so gracious. There's no condemnation, but he's asking the question. Jesus is asking the question you ask me, but I tell you, surely, surely, God is asking us to see that he is challenging the way that we 
persevere, that we perceive and persevere the way that we see his power and the way that we see how we have been called to an author that is higher, to a higher authority, to a higher identity that what this time gives us. We have been called to have that power to display. Say it to someone there in, in this feed, in this feed that we all handle so well, but your pastor, say it. I have the power to display. Amen, pastor. I am challenged. I am seeing it. We can see it. We are challenged. We're going to move behind the challenge. We're going to be transformed by the challenge. We are challenged to go and to see. In this season, Jesus in here, in the subject, he has been asking us to, he has been challenging us to go beyond. And we said it last week, we asked everyone to put in the feed, go and say, I be, I'm belonging and I am beyond. This is a word that is beyond. And we go beyond. What are we going beyond? No one asked that question. The feed is not there to do it like a dummy. The feed is there to ask questions so we can have conversations. Jesus was there to talk. Jesus was present. He sat down. He waited. And the word of the Lord is so beautiful. God doesn't need any of us to think he's an authority to be an authority. He doesn't have that weak identity. We have it. He's not like our friends in high school. He is a God that is in control and he wants us. He's challenging us to see to go beyond our natural abilities. He's wanting us to go through our natural abilities, beyond our natural abilities, in our emotions, in our finances, in our relationships, spiritually, in everything that entails your life. Whatever you put any accent, any importance, He wants you to go beyond your natural in that. If it's a that, He wants you to be there. He is also want us to see, to see and to believe, to be able to sow, to be able to live, to be able to invest beyond. He's challenging us to see, to believe, to sow and be invest in everything that is beyond us because he knows that if we stay in what is us, we will be limited. But he's saying, you are not like the ones that don't know me. I have given you a bigger a bigger portion. I want you to invest yourselves. Are you seeing? Are you going beyond what you see? He's challenging us to bring our faith outside of our text. And we saw this in the last weeks. He's wanting us to see it, to, to see our faith outside of ourselves, to really take over the streets. He's wanting us to see how God has given us, how Jesus in the story is saying, you know what? I could read it, but I'm just going to close it because I am it. He wants us to experience the person instead of to be so drawn by the text. In many levels, many of us would know by heart this text, but I don't know if our hearts are known by the one that inspired it. And Jesus wanting to have an intimate moment with you, with me. Come near. He wanting to have a moment. He's wanting to have a moment with your feelings, your emotions, your finances, the way that you perceive yourself. Don't say it to anyone. This is for you. He's wanting to see how you come out of the ordinary into the extraordinary. He's wanting to see how you come out of the natural, how he was understood by the people. He's wanting to break the flow, old flow, stagnant flow, that flow that goes around the bush, He's wanting you to know that you, you have been chosen, you have been preferred, that He's here for you, that there's nothing you have done that could just take His presence away from you, that He is loving you. That it's not that He loved you, but He is loving you. And there's no way, there's nothing so high, so low, so thick and so wide that you can get away with because He loves you. There's nothing you can do and are you with me? The power to display. He is challenging us in our faith to have faith. Faith is not something that I hope for only in the natural. Faith is something that I need God to do. If not, it would not happen. A lot of us have natural faith. The world has teach us, taught us how to, how to look at what we desire as our faith. That's called humanism and that's rubbish in this season that has burned down around the world. And we don't have to defend that or attack it. Just to have to say that faith is a lot more than that. Faith is a lot bigger than those little shoes can actually fit on. Faith is bigger. Faith is talking about a person. 
Faith is talking about relationship. Faith builds us for tomorrow, but also can manifest in our now. Faith is supposed to build for our tomorrow. Faith is supposed to be what we hope for and what we are certain that will happen, but it's building for our tomorrow. It's actually building for our tomorrow. It, but, but everything that builds for tomorrow will have to manifest today. I will love you tomorrow, but I have no actions today. That doesn't mean anything. As any person in any relationship, in any spectrum of it, as a son, as a daughter, as a husband, as a wife, as someone that you're working for, I will do it tomorrow. But your responsibility is not today. No. Faith, real faith, it is building for tomorrow, but it will manifest today. Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts I have for you. God himself is building ahead. I know the thoughts I had for you. Before the foundations of the world, I thought of you. I know the thoughts I have for you and, and thoughts to prosper you and to do good. Are you with me? This is the presence of God. He's leading us in our today. It's not only about our history. We're called to have that faith that is strong in history. We're called to have that faith that is for now. We're called to be led by our faith into our destiny. But Jesus is saying, for me, the now is a sweet spot. It's the place that I meet with you. You can talk about yesterday. You can talk about your tomorrow. But Jesus meets with you in your today. In none of the others. Jesus meets with you in your today. Are you with me? Amen. 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 Jeremiah 29, if you are the ones that are taking notes, you can go there. I know my thoughts for you. I know my thoughts. I know my thoughts. Do you know your thoughts? Have you wondered in your thoughts this week? God is challenging your thoughts in this season. God is wanting your faith to inform. God is challenging in this text to be informed by our faith. Our today has to be informed by our faith. Not only our yesterday, our today. The way that we live, our future, the way that we're acting today, Jesus is challenging us. The Lord is coming with a word that is bringing that life, that juice that brings us strength. He wants us to be focused. He wants us. Do you recognize? Do you recognize what God is doing today? He wants us to do that because that gives us the juice for our tomorrow. If we recognize our God today, it is easy to see his character in our tomorrow. If I don't know his character on my yesterday, I haven't been able taking, I have not taken the time, like we said in weeks past, to be able to memorize, to see, to, to, to ponder on what he has been doing, I cannot praise him for his yesterday in our lives. I cannot say, God, you have been faithful with authority with certainty of mind, but God wants to give us a bigger portion in our tomorrow. I don't care if you were not able to do it, and He doesn't care. He's giving you a fresh choice today. He's wanting you to recognize Him in your today, so you have authority to point out the author in your tomorrow. Are you with me? God is not wanting us to be victims of what is happening. He's giving us a position of authority, of prominence amongst the people to point out a God that is more than faithful and more than able and more that we can ask or imagine. But we got to recognize what he's doing among us today. Today, not only our yesterday, we have been given the power to display in our today, in our yesterday, but also in our tomorrow. We have the power to display him in the promises. We're looking we're looking at the promises of God. We're looking at what he has said. We're looking through the lenses of God, through the perspective of Jesus. In this story, Jesus is wanting to change the perspective of the people. You say, I would say. You say, I should do. You say that these people, you say that they didn't belong. But God is saying, hey, are you looking at me? I am the fulfillment. If we're looking at Jesus in this season, he's challenging on the way. He's steering on the way. He's steering our spirits. He's steering our sense of belonging. I belong. That was our last Weak, I belong. So the belonging and the challenge of Jesus go hand in hand. Jesus was changing the flow. He was controverted. He was counter, counter the diversion the of people and the thought that they had of religion because they had no love. But Jesus, that is love. Jesus that loves you today. Jesus that is prominent today. Jesus that through you is doing a new thing today. Have you not perceived it? Isaiah is saying, hey, I have given you a belonging, a challenge. I go hand in hand 
with both. And you got to stick with me. Challenging what? He's challenging what we have lost. What we have and what we have lost. He's challenging what, what is our, you know, what we display in our lives that is essential and is important. He's saying, hey, in this season you have this, and this season you have lost this. Are this what makes us who we are? That is not. He's also challenging what our conditions are. What has conditioned us, not only our conditions externally, but what has conditioned us internally. He's challenging our hearts. He's challenging our situations and how they have led us to perceive ourselves. He is. And we have to. We have to really dig in to what God is challenging us. Do we believe God? Do we really believe that He's He's our God. Do we, do we have that moment? Do we have that moment to actually stand in front of God and say, hey, you are my God. You are. You are my God. Jesus is challenging our identity. He's challenging the way that we're pushing back on it. In this season, we have to push back. And not only what are we pushing back, how we are pushing back. We are pushing back in the way that we live, the way that we react, the way that we project ourselves, what we know. Well, we have revelation, our revelation of yesterday, based on our obedience of yesterday. But if we obey today, God is wanting to go deeper. And that's the beauty of the gospel. That is not our yesterday. It's a relationship that grows. I knew things about my wife 15, 17 years ago that today I think I didn't know much. I didn't know. I didn't know much. But today I see myself in a different place. I'm projecting myself on a love. Our lives are called to project that love, that love through our time, through our lives, through our money, what we believe. He's calling us to, to understand our construct, the idea of our construct. We talked about it briefly last week. He's asking us to understand how we invest ourselves. How do we perceive what is happening? How do we move? And essentially, how we don't allow the, word, uh, the world around us to move us. The Word of God comes to establish us, for us to push back. And we're pushing on in the deposit that Jesus did in us. I am the fulfillment. We're pushing. We today, we have been empowered. We have been powered to display because He is the source. I belong because He is the source. I can show my ID because He is the source. And that's the perspective of this Word. Jesus came in that moment to heal to heal expectations. He was looking at the audience and saying, hey, you don't expect much from me, man. I'm a lot more than your little scroll. The scroll is important. The text is important. It's essential. But the revelation, you cannot live without it. A lot of things around the world have been called essential or not essential in this, in this time, in this season. But we got to know that Jesus is more than essential. Jesus came to heal our expectations. Jesus came in that moment to heal what they expected from God. They expected things to be written and to be read, but they didn't expect people to have revelation and to live them. The world around us has expectations of something that is real. God is calling His church, His people, you and me, to have expectations of Him coming through and making everything we have read a reality. Something that we are proud of to say, hey, that's my God. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what your God is doing. I don't know if he's in vacations or in lockdown. But my God, <laughs> my dad is, my God is doing something new. I have expectations. I have expectations. I want, I'm expecting something. Don't you perceive it? Don't you perceive Isaiah 45? He's, he's actually coming to hear our ideas. He's healing our expectation. He's healing our ideas. He's healing our revelation of what the world will call knowledge, what we know of God. He came to heal our understanding, the way that we stand under expectations, ideas, and knowledge, the way that we stand under. Under who? Under who? Who He is. We're here and we're called. Jesus is having a trumpet call moment over our lives. Through this word, through these three weeks, as a church, as Hope and Anchor, as anyone that sees us around the world, if you call this your church, He's asking you under who you're standing. Your ID is standing under me. We're standing under who He is. He, we also 
are challenged in the way that we understand who we are. Because when you stand under Him, you start understanding who you are. You can stand under His knowledge of you. Not only who He is, you stand under that, but you stand under who He understands you. The idea, the perception of God. You don't start doubting if you're a lover, you're not loving, you have authority. If you are able to heal or not heal, away with that religious thought. Who He is and who you are what you're able to do and what we are called to do. This is our vocation. This is what God is challenging through this simple word, this simple moment. He opened it up. He closed it and said, I am this thing. I know you are, you're certain that I should be reading. I know that we are going to read what he opened in the scroll because we need it. But he didn't need that. They understood that. Our generation is very literate on the Bible. We got to understand what he said. But for this moment, in this little moment that we have together, the important thing that it says, he was challenging it. And he said, I am that. We're going to read it before we finish. But you got to understand, he's all that. He's all that and even more than your mind can understand or imagine. More than you can see and perceive. He's more. He's Jesus. He comes today to challenge us in power. And now we're getting into the text of today. He's coming to actually really challenge the way that we see power. The power that has been given unto us by grace. The power to display His glory. The power to display His person. His, his authority over us. He is because He knows us. He knows us and He knows us by name. He knows that we can be impressed. He knew that the people there in the synagogue were impressed. They were impressed by the things that he said. They said, wow, what a grace. What a grace comes through his lips. They were impressed. They were challenged. Maybe like you and me. But it is unto us the decision if we're going to be impressed and challenged by these words that God is throwing at us. He's investing in us. He's nourishing us with or we're going to be changed, or we're going to be transformed. Jesus was there in the synagogue with many, but many of them, although they heard the grace, they heard the graceful voice of the author of life, they were there with the life itself, the word, the truth, and the life. They were there, and they were impressed and challenged. But maybe they were not transformed. They were not changed. Maybe they didn't find it in their hearts to say, Jesus, I really need revelation. I need a revelation of this word. I cannot sustain this. I cannot miss out. I don't want you to miss out in my life. I love you too much. I humble myself. I really want you to live. I really want to be able to hold that power to display your glory. Are you with me? God knows that we could be impressed. But He's not going, He's not aiming at impressing us because God is not insecure. He's not only aiming at challenging us like we have been discussing. He wants to transform us, to change us, to change our hearts to the fullness of what He sees, to His perspective. He wants us to be. But every time He wants us to be, there's a but. And after a be and a but, there's an into. And if you're with me, He wants to challenge us to understand Him. Jesus, He wants us to be powerful. The word comes clear. It says he wants us to be powerful, but we need to be shaped and molded. As we read just before in Elijah's time, there was, there was a famine. The, the sky was shut and there was many, many, many widows. And he chose them as vehicles. He wants us to be vehicles of his presence. He's asking us to understand, okay, you're not the center of it, but I, the center, want to manifest my glory my multifold, my multi-way glory over you. He's going to show His face through all your talents, your virtues, and even your weaknesses for the glory of God. He is asking you to just open your life. Just open it. He's saying, hey, even in your weakness, I can shape you. He was talking about a widow. Widow. The widow is in Sarapath. Though Sarapath actually means a house of furnace. And actually where they will shape gold. In this season, God is wanting us to be powerful, but He needs us to be shaped and molded like that widow. She was shaped and molded by the need that she had, by, by what she didn't have around, but her perspective, her relationship with God 
was not taken as easy as people would take in society. God took care of her. God is taking care of us. He knows we need, but he knows also that we need a furnace. We need situations that carry us to his feet, to his cross, because we will not come. Our tendency is to want to be our own gods. He wants us to understand we need a furnace. And that furnace doesn't come to do anything else but to bring life. That's a furnace of life. And that furnace of life through the life of the widow that we talked last week, it's supposed to heat up. Situations, life, everything around us is heating up. We're needing hope like never before. History doesn't know how to read or how to spell or how to write hope more clearly than in this season. Jesus is asking us, hey, do you understand that I have you on my furnace? You are my church. You are my bride. You are my people. And I need you to be part of the furnace. But you're not alone in it. I'm heating it up. I'm heating it up to shape you, to develop you. I'm not burning you. Sarepa actually means that place, that furnace where they mold gold. So that widow was in that place. She was golden. We talked about it last week. She was golden. But God is wanting to say, hey, I'm not burning you. I want to shape, to mold your value, your worth, so you'll be at display. So you will be a display of my glory, of my presence, of my promises, of my joy, of my vibrancy, of my, of my movement, of my bestowing of oil for everyone else. Not only for you, God is calling you to be. I can be golden. I can be gold but I need fire. If we go into that humility, if we go into that place, God himself is helping us. Are you with me? Are you with me in this point? We can be cold, but I need fire. I need the furnace. Fire, furnace brings purification. It brings hard motivations out of the way. There are motivations in the scripture where Jesus is saying, hey, truly, truly, I know your motivations. I know you're going to demand actions from me, but I just want you to believe. Our motivations in this season are getting purified through all this fire, are getting shaped. A fire is shaping us, purifying us, shaping us, developing us to that place of value. He wants us to get as much as we can for what we are living. God is not wanting you to live things just because. He's not abusive. He's not a dictator. He actually enjoys who you are your tone of voice, the time you spend with him. He wants you to be a vehicle of his glory, like these ones that he chose. He chose the widow. He chose these examples, and he chose another one that we're going to talk more certainly today. He chose another vehicle to be a vehicle, not only of that truth, that you belong like he did with the widow, but a vehicle of grace, because Jesus was about, all about being there for you and taking care of you, about that truth and about that grace. And he was actually using them in the midst of their struggle, the famine and their need, their lack of understanding of what they had, a little bit of oil. If we saw the last, last preaching, last Sunday's preaching, you would see that she didn't expect much because she didn't perceive what she had as much. But Jesus is asking us as his church to say, hey, I have more than I need. I might be picking sticks. I might be actually in a famine, like it says in this, this part of the text. But I am more than that. God is using me as an example for my tomorrow, for the people that are coming after me. He's using her as an example, her need in that moment. Because God is a God of yesterday as well. He's using for our now. That's how God so elegantly starts closing up the idea of Jesus. And we could dissect this so long, but Jesus in a second, he sits down, it's done, I'm that. I was with the widow, I was with the other guy, are you listening? And they didn't get it, but we have the option today to see this in a better spectrum. We have revelation, we're able to sit under his teaching and get insight of his heart. Our struggle, what is our struggle today? Is someone's salvation tomorrow. Without the widow, having the need without Naaman this man with leprosy without them we might not see that our struggle today is someone's salvation without our struggle today maybe someone tomorrow will not have the hope 
to really understand what God is doing us. God has given us the power to display. Say to someone right there, I have the power. I have the power to display. I've not been, I've not been taken back by what is going. And even if I have, he has pulled the extra bits on me. I have the power to display. He has been used, he has been using me to point out, to point out even in the people that don't know him, his grace and what he is doing. He was pointing it out in outsiders, people that were not from the culture of the Pharisees in the synagogue. He was talking about the widow and the winner. And we're going to go about the winner today. God doesn't allow, and he's wanting us not to allow what people think of God to box you in, to box what he is in you, to box you in a box of, of natural what is supposed to be displayed as supernatural. He has given you the power to display the supernatural. Jesus is with the widow and is using as an example of who he is for the ones that don't have, for the destituted, for the ones that don't, don't have what they think they need. And he says, I don't leave you. And today he says, I not only don't leave you, but he's mentioning a man that we will find in the Bible. And if you want to go to it, because just for the sense of time, you can go into 2 Kings verse 5, chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, you can go into the life of Naaman, but Jesus is using it, using it because he wants to use his example to count in that extra flow, that's different flow, that, that counter flow, that contravertere that he wants to create in the people. He's actually using this example as a vehicle. Not only the widow is a vehicle of his grace that I'm there for you when you don't have what you think is essential, but I'm here when you are a winner and still that is not enough. He's going from one side to the spectrum to another. God comes for all of us, the ones that don't have enough and the ones that have more than enough and still is not enough. We could be a widow, we could be a winner, but that doesn't mean that we're in with God and that is what suffices our soul that's what the world around us is looking that's what the world is asking from the church are you are going to be the ones that show me how I am enough in him how I have more than enough through his presence are you going to be the one in there thirsty and God's going to bless the ones that are thirsty to see his justice and the church is there to point at God like Jesus is pointing through this man to the person of God. He says actually that he was controversial. He said that they didn't like what they said. And actually Jesus was using the, the life of this leopard that we will know in the scripture as Naaman. He was using it as an example. But who was Naaman? Who was Naaman? Naaman was a winner, so we're going to describe him as that. He was also an example of grace. So that lets you know that even though he's a winner, Usually winners are not the example of grace. Those are the ones that lost. Those are the ones that didn't have enough. But Jesus is strangely using the winner to display the grace. So if you're winning today, understand this, that you know the favor of God makes you win, so you display the grace of God. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget the grace that has found you. Don't forget the momentum, the strength, the breath that is in your nostrils right now is to display His grace. And He uses that for that. And, and who we see in the story, if we go into 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, we, we will see that He's a conqueror, that He's a powerful, strong man, a man that is fit physically, outside, you know, His muscle, He's used to battle, He's notorious, he, He's famous, He's prestigious, He's the one that delivered the nation of Syria from the enemy. He's the one that caused them to win. He is the one that the king trusts. He's, he's consecrated and condecorated. He's the winner. He's influential. He's wealthy. He's able to just pull finances from different places. He's radical. He had a point of view and he was going to win. Today, we see Jesus that he's not only with the widow that didn't have. We're talking about a winner. That's a very complex character that we see in the text. He actually was the one that was tenacious. He's the one that was generous with the people that would help him. Jesus is touching so many levels on what they knew this Syrian general was in this story. He's unscrolling it and he's saying, hey, you didn't get me? Let me just refresh the story to you. History says that the widows and this man Naaman 
were found by me as well, through my prophets. Naaman was a loving man, although he didn't know how to love. He was affected, although he was a conqueror. He was affected, although he was powerful. He was affected, although he was strong. He was affected, although he was notorious and famous and he has prestige. He, he was affected, although he was condecorated and he was of influence. He was affected, although he had all the means. He was healthy and wealthy on what the people saw. But he was affected, he was a leper. And in that moment, lepers had to be destituted from everything. But because of all that list, that we see displayed in his life and through the relationships that he had, he had in that moment, we see how everything could be going for you, but if one area, if one area goes wrong, everything else is affected. Your power, your strength, your influence, your wealth, your medals, your fame, your Instagram followers, one area can be affected. Everything can be affected because of one area. And maybe those areas, we can see them through the addictions that have developed in this season. Maybe we can see that those, those areas are, you know what, we have given space to sadness. Maybe we have given space to an addiction of porn. Maybe we have uh, given a space to stress. Maybe we have allowed the volume of stress to go crazy or the violence. Maybe we have become more violent in the way that we think, in the way that we treat others. Maybe, maybe we have allowed that, that affection, that, that area that has affected us to run us to a place of loneliness, of selfishness. Maybe we have allowed that that no one sees but Jesus, that he didn't send it to any of the lepers of Israel, but God through Elisha, he sent them to this man that had all these condecorations. He was well observed, he was a winner. Maybe we're winners, but we have been self-harming. Maybe we're winners, but we, we have been negative. Maybe we have condemning, we have been condemning of others. Maybe we have fallen in, in lapses of criticism. Maybe, maybe we display a spirit of a conqueror, but, but maybe we have become passive. And Jesus is saying, hey, I don't know if you lack, I don't know if you display any of these things that have affected you in the private, I am with you. I came to heal you, to display my grace through you. The word of God as we close is giving us an idea. ID is not in our brokenness. In this season, as we close this series today, we see that God is not thinking about how we are being affected, what has affected us, what we are addicted to, and what we've been disconnected from, what has been disconnected from us. He's not looking of our actions only and what we lack. He's asking us to understand our ideas not in what we lost and what we have been taken away from. He's asking us to understand our ideas not in our situation, our circumstances, and our social standing. The, what we have, what we don't have. He's, he's saying uh, your ID is not in the relationships that hold you or you hold dear. Your ID is not that. Your ID is in me. It's in Jesus. I am the fulfillment of this word, says Jesus. I will sit down in your life if you understand. I can scroll it and open it and, and I can let you know that I am all this for you today. I will close it and close, close the scroll in front of everyone that surrounds you, everyone that understands you, everyone that sees you. And I will sit in your life if you understand your identity is in me. Jesus is coming with his words saying, hey, yeah, your ID is, is not only for you. Your ID is in you. Your ID is through you. Jesus is your ID. Is for you, Jesus is for you, is through you, because Jesus is through you, and Jesus is in you. Jesus is saying, I came for you, Jesus came for us. Write it there, there in the feed, say, He came for us. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He came to say, I am the fulfillment, and if you got me, you got what it takes. 
if you want to summarize all this time that we've been together, you got to say, I know it has taken a little bit longer for the ones that are ADD. You should get in love with the Word because the Word comes alive and grips lives through you and through you. He says, I am for you. I came for you. I came to develop in you that spirit of grace, that spirit of belonging. You got to show who you are. You belong and there's grace through you, not only in you, but through you for others. He came for us to deliver, for us to forgive, for us to be able to incarnate and encourage the favor of God. He came for us to heal like he sent the disciples. Let them heal. Let them deliver. Away with the religiosity that thinks not only God delivers. No, he is in you and through you he heals and he delivers. He's sent you. He has sent you. He is in you. He is for you to be able to be a provider through you. You will provide hope and future. You will provide a bread. You will provide love. You will you, you provide companionship. You will be able to convey to people that God is near. It is in you. God is filling you all with the power. He's filling you all with that, that power and that truth to be able to convey the truth. Isaiah 60 says very clear, verse 1 to 3 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news. This is in the NIV version. He has, he has anointed me to proclaim the good news. For what? To proclaim the good news. He has sent me to bind the broken heart, to proclaim the freedom to the captives, and to release from darkness the prisoners that is in you already, to proclaim the year of His favor that is in you already. Say amen right there in the feed. And then the vengeance of our God, the day of vengeance of our God is coming, but He has sent me to comfort those who mourn. The ones that don't think they have enough. The ones that are choosing sticks to see how they cook and die. God is asking us, His church, to find the ones that are gathering sticks because He's a God for all of them. He's a God that says, I see you. I'm near. Not only for the ones that need, but for the ones that are great. He says, you know, and I'll provide for those who grieve inside and to bestow on them a crown of beauty for the ones Naaman didn't have internal beauty really. He was doubting. He had leprosy. He was hiding from the, the people that were perceiving as beautiful and powerful because he knew he was lacking. But he says, you know, I, you will bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That's what they will put to dry up the wounds, to hide the oozing out of their wounds and the oil, the oil of gladness, the oil of joy instead of mourning. Instead of your sentence to die, he's saying you will give, you will give the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise. You thought you were a winner before me, but you needed me to be alive. In that sense, and as we close, he said that he's actually using us to give a, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Many people have love, their hope, have lost their, their hope in this season. Many people have lost their, their hope in this season. But you, the ones that have been touched by Jesus, you will be called oaks of righteousness, strong, sturdy, rooted. Jesus wants us to be rooted. You'll be called a planting of the Lord. And for what? For the display of His splendor. In this season, God is saying, hey, I called you. I call you to deliver, to forgive, to exchange that bitterness for joy, to be able to encourage and to heal, to provide that hope, that, that future, that bread, that companionship, that, that love that is so characteristic of me. But you got to understand that you have been called first. You have been called to display his splendor, His grace, His love, His presence. It is time for us to settle on our ID as we close this season and this series. God has called us to settle on that ID that He gives us once and for all. Jesus is what holds us. Our ID is held in Jesus. Once and for all, we got to cross the line. It's time to cross the line. And also, 
He has actually given us those, those desires and directions for us to create movement. Movement creates restoration. Naaman, in the story, if you go to 2 Kings chapter 5, he had to do things. In this season, God is going to prescribe for us, not something as a recipe, but something for us to understand that we need some actions in our deliverance. And for others to receive from us, there has to be signs of that freedom of us understanding that He is the fulfillment of that word in our lives, that He sits on our life, and that creates movement in our lives. And as we close, God is delivering a word that is full of faith, that is full of power, that is full of freedom, and He's wanting us to understand that we have the power, the power to display, but He wants us to understand that we, const we have been constructed for this. We have been constructed to live, to react, to project, to believe, to belong, and to invest. And that was really quick. I will repeat it again. That was actually, we're constructed to live, to react. We're constructed to project and believe, to belong, and to be able to invest, to perceive. We also have been called through this season by God. We have been brought up in power and in truth to be able to teach, to impart. In this season, God is using us to teach and to impart to the most small details in your life, to the biggest example of His glory. God is using us to teach and to impart, to give away, to deliver, to bestow, to bestow, to put over, to take away and just recover with oil the wounds and the life of many. And last, we have been called to bring a different flow. Jesus, through all this story, what he wanted to say, as we finish three weeks of this series, he's going to say, I got a different flow. And He has called us into this different flow to be able to create new movement, to call attention to His wonders, to who He is, to the amazing power of His love and His grace, that He is exceptional, that God is exceptional in them, that He is extraordinary in their lives and in your life and in our lives. God has called us to bring a different flow, a counter flow, a counter vertere that fills our soul that actually gives us the ability to infect others with admiration about who God is. Don't you want that? Don't you want people to understand how great God is? To infect others with that admiration. And lastly, to make the lover of our soul famous. That Jesus is known. That the church, that your life and my life was just a good vehicle say Jesus was good to me. You should try it. He knows you. He covers you. He's there for you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, Father, I pray for the ones that know your name and the ones that don't know. For the ones that don't know, Father, if we repent by your name, Father, we say you are the only Savior. You are the only source, Father. You are the only Lord. We will be saved, says the Bible. Father, if we repent of our sins, but for the ones that already know you and they have not seen you, Father, in this way, this week, Father, in this month, in this year, Father, in this season, and maybe before in their lives, Father, you have a better way. You are their portion. You are the fulfillment of the promise in their lives and through their lives. Father, have your way, Lord. Father, I ask for your presence, your spirit, Lord. Father, to come, Father, near, because you bestow you take care of the ones that have been forgotten. Father, you, you are the one that gives gladness to the ones that have none. You, Father, you are the one that points and directs the ones that thought they had little and showed them they had much, Father. So you are the one that actually are there also with the winners that thought they had to project themselves like that to be able to be loved. Father, you are that one. Father, you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. Father, have your way, Lord. Your healing, Father, through this word, Father. Your fire, Father. Your, your, fire, your remuneration, Father, of strength. Father, of stamina, Father, in their faith, in their person, Father, in their mind, Father. For the ones that don't know you, Lord, let there be revelation, Father. Let there be light. So this love, Lord, this presence, that right, is just right here, right now, flowing, Lord, so strong, Lord. Father, right there, where they are, Lord forms part of how they start deciding in their direction for the rest of their lives, Lord. Father, we bless you. We bless your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I got to leave you.
time is short. I don't want to take more of your day or your time. But I got to say, you cannot miss Hope Kids. Hope Kids is coming in a minute. At 4.30 UK time, it's going to be around. If you're watching this during the week, you will see all the displays, the titles, and so on. Put it under your kids. Bless them. It has been a blessing for many. Many, 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 many young people have been blessed by the word, what the team is putting together in such an amazing way, led by the Holy Spirit. And it's so good, so good to see the testimonies. Not only what we see in the first bit of this communication, but also the ones that are coming from the younger side of life, you know, the ones that call themselves young. Not you and you, me, probably. And also, during the week now, we have the Anchor of the Week. You cannot miss that because the Lord is doing something great. He's doing something new, and He's ready to surprise you. Remember, show your ID. You belong. You are there to really project the strength, the stamina of God. You are there for the Lord to be able to represent His glory. Have a great day. God bless you. Bye-bye.
Yes, thank you so much guys for joining us. As always, it's been an amazing service uh, and we're super grateful that you guys yeah. can join us. Uh, but there's gonna be so much going on throughout the week actually, so yeah. Yeah, there are so many different ways that you can stay connected to the church family this week. And as you know, that starts this afternoon at 4.30 for our Hope Kids program, both on Facebook and on YouTube. That's right. And as always as well, we have connect groups going on throughout the week. So if you'd like to join us, get involved, join online or through Zoom, uh, you could Write us and we'll just plug you right in. It's really cool. Uh, and don't forget as well, there's also the Anchor of the Week podcast that happens every week involving this lady here, which is really awesome. If you haven't heard it, please listen to it. It's amazing and it's available on all uh, social media platforms and podcast platforms. Yes. And if you would like to donate to our mission and ministry that we've got going on here in London and be a part of the different outreach initiatives that we've got going on in our city, then you can do so through either the Tidely app or our website. Both will be linked below. And as always, we love to hear from you. So if you have a testimony of how God has been moving in your life or speaking to you, Please. we would love it if you've gotten in touch with us on social media so you can be a part of our services. Yeah, that's right. And as always, thank you, thank you guys so much for joining us. It's been amazing. Yeah. We're looking forward to seeing you guys next week. See you.